Hello everyone and welcome to my talk, Yeet Lead with OBS Query, Effective Threat Handling Without Breaking Bank. Let me first start by introducing myself. Who am I? My name is Sebastian Pravas. I'm a lead security engineer at a company called Beacon, and I've also experienced with building the security operations function for a financial tech company. In my free time, I like to dabble around with tools and resources related to information security. I like to travel the world, and I like to go to the gym, sometimes after a hard day of work to clear my mind. Now, let me first explain a little bit what my motivation is, what my thought process is for this talk, why I'm doing this talk. So nowadays at present, we have lots of EDR, MDR, XDR solutions who are seen as the one-stop solution for security. They are seen as the answer for security, especially in endpoints and devices. Because they are seen as the solution, Lots of companies, they want to compete. So there are also lots of companies who are presenting their own solution. Some of the more known ones are Falco from CrowdStrike, Singularity from Sentinel-1, you have Carbon Black from VMware, and so on and so on. Because they're seen as the one-stop solution for security, they're quite, sometimes quite expensive, they're quite pricey. But that doesn't bother people, that doesn't bother companies, because people and companies, they want to stay safe. And they, they, they think, oh, it's one-stop solution for security. We don't mind paying for that. But sometimes these solutions, they still miss common techniques and payloads. They still miss some basic items, basic elements that might slip through the nets and that will give a foothold for potentially malicious actors or red teams. Now, my talk is not to say that things are bad. No, not at all. They're actually quite good. My talk is just to show how Obiscary can potentially help the solutions, how Obiscary can complement those solutions. So basically, to improve security on endpoints and devices, let's make the, the solutions and Obiscary work next to each other. Let's make them complement each other to keep everyone as secure as possible. So what can you expect from my talk? First, I'll introduce you to Obiscary. What is it? Who made it? And what are, what are its capabilities? Then I'll go over a few command and control frameworks and the payloads, how to set them up and what they provide. Why am I doing this? Because some of them I might use a little bit as an example for a download talk as well. When we pass that, I'll also show um, how you can catch reverse shells. And right before that, I'll also show you how a whiskey can be used to actually catch those command and control frameworks. And now that is done, I'll also show you how you can create alerting pipelines from when an event's happening and obviously you find something all the way to alerting your security operations team so they can intervene whenever it's necessary. Because of course, if something's happening, you want your security operations team to be able to intervene or to see if it's uh, a false positive or not. Now that is done, I'll quickly, quickly give a quick sea trip of what we've seen around the entire talk. Let me first start. Let me first start by introducing to OS Query. What is OS Query? OS Query is an operations operating system instrumentation framework that mainly supports Windows, macOS, Linux, FreeBSD. It can potentially support other operating systems as well, but you would have to compile them themselves. For those the, the four I've I've mentioned, there are pre-built packages that can be downloaded on the official site. Originally, Obiscary was made by Facebook. It was made by Facebook because they want to have an easy way to have an insight on the overall state of the infrastructure. Nowadays, it's maintained by a separate foundation that started by Facebook and Linux Foundation together to be able to maintain the growing Obiscary ecosystem. That foundation that maintains the ecosystem um, employs mobile developers from Facebook, Google, Collide, Optics, you name some companies that use uh, Whiskery, and they might have a few commits in, in the core as well. Some of the big companies that still use Whiskery nowadays are Netflix, New Uber, Airbnb, and Facebook, of course, and quite a few others. Now, how does this work? How does Whiskery actually work? So basically, the operating system is exposed as a relational database with OS query. You can use SQL queries to, to explore the operating system. You have tables 
the most of the tables represent the state of different parts. For example, you have the process list, you have running processes. You want to have, you want to ask the state from a certain process. You know, a bit always query. You can also ask what state my kernel modules, which are loaded, which are not loaded. Or an other example, the stat command in Linux gives you the the, the the that moment state of a file, the access time, the creation time, modify time, permissions. You can use you, you can do the same thing by using a SQL query in OS query. Now there are two, two, two different kinds of tables. You have event-driven tables and tables that purely show state. What I said before, the state tables um, are tables that show the state of um, at that point, a snapshot of that point of what you're asking for, for example, the files, the processes, or um, installed extensions, or browser, ex browser extension, for example. Now, you have also event-driven tables. Those tables, they, get, they have their data that's being pushed by out in the APIs. For example, uh, file events. Um, example, let's say I copy a file the directory, that's an event. That event will get pushed to the file events table in OS query. There are multiple tables like that. You have file events, you have process, process events. That, for example, a process just executes a command or moves a file around or something like that, that will then be shown in a process events table. You're basically listening to events on different levels of the operating system. Now, Windows, you can make OS query even more powerful by kind of linking together with Sysmin. That will go uh, deeper in that later because this will be very useful to catch certain elements. Now, I would like to show a few examples of OS query, how it actually works. My first example is around file information. Like I mentioned before, you can ask the state of a file with a simple SQL query. Now, as you can see, as you can see on the slides, I have an example for Windows and Linux. The query basically, the query basically asks for the path, the directory, the file name, the inode, type, and the user ID from a file in a certain directory, and the file name has to start with the word defcon for Windows. Now you can see it finds everything, but no user ID because the user ID field is only filled in in Linux and macOS, but never on Windows. As you can see on Linux, I asked for the same information, just a different part and different file name. And you can see the, uh, it, the user ID field is now not zero, but a certain number, which is a user ID that owns the file. Now, this is quite a simple, a simple example. Let's go to the next example. This next example is around listing ports. You can, with a simple SQL query, also say, okay, I want to see every process or I want to see every, all information of the process that listens on a certain port of processes that start with a certain name or certain word that is in the name of the process. Now, with this query, I'm looking for the, list, the address, the port, and the path of a process that's listening on a certain port, but the process name has to contain the word OS query or Splunk. And you, as you can see, you can use even inner joins in, in, in OS query. This is a simple inner join based on this field that's the same one on both tables. Now, in Windows, we have the result of there's a Splunk process running, listening on port 8089. Now, Linux, we see that it finds, again, a Splunk process listing in certain ports. However, it also finds a socket file. Because in Linux, you can also, if, if you query listing ports, you can also see socket files. And always query, listen, um, you a socket file for some communication between processes. So this basically shows you how you can combine two tables to get the information you would like to have. Now, my third example is quite useful to show as well. Um, in Windows and Linux, you can query for pipes, name pipes, anonymous pipes, open pipes. Now, as we all know, in Windows, certain uh, families of malware or um, control frameworks, the agents or stages, they use named or anonymous pipes to communicate with maybe sacrificial processes or with some other part of their code or whatsoever. So as an example of Windows, I basically said, give me all information from the table pipes where the name contains my first name, Sebastian, and it gives me three pipes. As we can see that the three, three 
um, there are three types with with my name still in it, still open, still running. And apparently, Microsoft Teams has a pipe as well with my first name in. However, I never use Microsoft Teams. This is on Windows 11 preview, so maybe that's why at this moment I should figure it out even more. Now, on Linux, there's a small difference between Linux and Windows because on, on Linux you can only query open pipes, but you will never have their names. You will have the process ID that it might belong to, the inodes, the modes, the file descriptor, and sometimes all the fields are filled in as well. That's basically it, what you will see in Linux. So there you might have to use some, some joins together to have some more information. But this example shows you how is this to also look very for open pipes, you know, easy it is to get gather that information it might be useful um, in the long run. Now let's head to the second step. Comment and control frameworks and the payloads. So in this part, I will go over one or two comment and control frameworks and the types of payloads, and afterwards how you can potentially catch them. Why am I showing these common control frameworks and payloads? Because I would like to use them as a little bit of an example on how you might be able to catch their, them with OS query. What are common control frameworks exactly? Um, they can also be seen as post exploitation frameworks. They are mostly used by either bad actors or by their teams after they initially exploited the system of the victim that they want to exploit. They need some sort of breach head. They need uh, something that allows them from, from outside to get back on the, on the computer without having to um, exploit the system again. So that's why they sometimes use computer control frameworks. Now, these frameworks, they provide accessible ways for privilege escalation, comment execution, pivoting and lateral movements, and so on and so on. They have lots of multiple function, lots of functionalities. They can also be used on multiple kind of on multiple operating systems, um, Linux, Mac OS, Windows, you name it. There's probably at least one common control framework that has some functionality to use on those op on that operating system. A few of the more known ones are um, Empire, Mythic, Cobalt Strike, of course, everyone knows. And you have a few others like Caldera, you have Shadow, and so on and so on. Now, the first one I'd like to talk about is Empire. The Empire C2 framework, um, it has like a Metsploit like command line interface. There is also a user interface for it called Starkiller. But in this example, I'll all, I will only show um, quickly how the command line interface looks like. It's a little bit like Metsploit. It has um, out completion and quite easy to use. Originally, this was um, a command control framework with PowerShell for Windows. But um, more like pure PowerShell. But um, further down the road, it's also gained capabilities for Linux and OS X with Python 3. How can you how can you deploy Empire? You can deploy it using Docker, you can use Kali Linux, or you can do it manually, however you you um, however you like it. My example, I quickly explain how you can deploy it with Docker. So first you pull the Docker image. When that's done, then you can create an, a persistent storage that even when you shut down the, the, um, the Docker instance, the storage with potentially payloads and stages is still there. When that's done, you can run basically the Docker image that you pulled in the beginning with the persistent storage, and it will start up the Docker, the, the Docker container for Empire. And when it's running perfectly, you can see on, my, on the slides what, what interface will look like. Now, Empire has multiple different stages. So not really agent stages. Why just stages? Because they are quite small. Um, and when you have a stage executed on the target device, then you can send comments to that stager. That those comments include code that will come from your Empire control server, basically. Some of the stages are shell code, some are done with uh, dynamically, linked, dynamically, linked, dynamically linked libraries, you can gfiles, macros, you name it. On the screenshot, you can also see the different kinds of stages that Empire has. 
uh, most of them of Windows and Mac OS. So the, the multi ones, some of them also will work in Linux. Now, the second framework I would like to talk about is the Mythic framework. Mythic framework is a cross platform command control framework. You can basically run it on, on almost anything, just like Empire, because it, um, it runs in, you can run it in a Docker container. It's uh, basically, it's a bit different than Empire. Empire provides already all the stages. With Mythic, it's a plug and play architecture. You can say, um, you can start with Mythic, it won't contain anything but you can, along the way, add more uh, agents or profiles. How do you deploy it? Uh, again, we just Docker. Um, the web interface, database, the backend, everything runs in a separate doc container. That's what makes it so modular and plug and play architecture. Now, how do you install this one? Um, you first clone this one repository, then it also has an install script that basically sets up all the contents you need, from the database, the queues, uh, listeners for your web interface, everything. And then you can use its own command, um, command line interface to start the entire framework. And as, as a result, you get a nicely pre-built user interface. It's quite actually quite easy to use. Um, in my opinion, a bit easier than Empire, but everyone to their own, of course. Now, as I said before, Mythic has a plug and play architecture. What I mean with this, so when you install Mythic, you don't have any pre-built agents that are delivered with Mythic. Nowadays, you can find those agents in a separate GitHub, separate GitHub repositories where you can install them from. You have agents written in JavaScript for Automation, which is for macOS, in Golang, Python, c .net. And It's quite easy to install. As an example, I can, uh, I'm showing you how you can install an agent or a profile. For example, I want to install the Appful agent, which is an agent that is usable for macOS. I just have to use the command line again and provide the GitHub link to the repository of that agent. I can do this and it just works. The same with the profile. I want, of course, a command control profile as well for HTTP or HTTPS or DNS, something else. All these different profiles are listed in their own personal GitHub repositories. And you just install them by using the command line again. Now, what's also useful about all these agents is that the functionality is already built in. They're not just stagers. They're stagers, they're actually agents. For example, the Apple agent already contains functionality to take a screenshot or to do certain other, certain other functionality that's maybe not in all other stages for other frameworks. Or for example, the Apollo, the Apollo agent for Mythic also contains certain functionality to take screenshots or to try to elevate your permissions or to do certain in injections and stuff like that. Now, shall we delete? So now I would like to show you how you can potentially use OS query to catch certain things from, the f um, from those frameworks or other frameworks. So there are multiple ways to use OS query. There are multiple ways that you can use OS query to um, catch IOCs, indications of compromise. Uh, one is Yara rules, you have file integrity monitoring, you have process events. You can easily combine OS query with Sysmon to catch certain IOCs based on events provided by Sysmon. As, discussed, as I discussed, discussed before, I'll show you how you can do this with Sysmon as well, because this creates something quite powerful. I'll also show you how you can catch reverse cell connections with OS query as well. Let's start with, with Yara rules. What is Yara actually? Yara is a way of identifying malware or other files or even processes with a rule set. The implementation of this query is with file integrity monitoring. What basically means is I can map a directory to a certain Yara rule sets. And then when a file gets moved into a directory or created or copied, it will trigger the Yara rule that the Yara rule will scan that file. And if the rule matches the file, or the, 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 the file matches the rule, then it will create an event that can be potentially seen as an indicator of compromise. Now, during my investigation for this talk, I found out that specifically the move to file action was not covered by this. 
this was specifically missing only for the Yara events implementation in the West query. So basically, if in Linux or Mac OS, you would use the move command, mv command, you move around files, it would never trigger the rule because the OS query wouldn't see that if you wanted to scan that, those files with Yara. So I made a uh, pull request to the OS query core to fix this. So it would also trigger move to um, file actions. Now this has been accepted last night and should arrive in the next version of OS query as well to, for even better protection with the other rules. Now you, you can also say, why not move from file actions? Well, move from file actions, that means that you move file away from the directory you're monitoring. So since only one scan files in a directory, it makes the sense to also um, cover the move from. I will now show you an example of how a YAR rule configuration looks like and what it potentially can do and how it looks like as a result. So here, a very, very small rule that basically um, I've written as an example for this talk. And it basically should detect an empire Windows shell code stager for 64 bit systems. Uh, I referred, and as reference, I used the GitHub link to the Empire uh, Comment and Control Framework. And basically, it says if the two strings you see on the screen are seen in the file of the ARA, then it will trigger an event because that means that the file matches the YAR rule. The first string is mini Empire DLL, that's always in those uh, 64 bit Windows shell code stagers. And the second is a series of characters that can be seen with an hex, with an hex editor. So if both strings are present in the file, it will trigger the rule and create an event. What does it look like as a result? So as example, um, I basically copied the stager file to Linux system to show there. And you use directory home shadow, you monitor that with your events. And the moment I copy empire underscore default bin file into that directory, the moment I commit the Java implementation in the will scan that file. Now when we scan that files, it will trigger the rule because it matches the, the, the strings in the, in the rule. And the result, you can look in a table called Yara underscore events, and you can see that certainly in the directory, a file appeared and then was updated that matches that rule. And like that, we have defense. Now this then can be shown later on with alerting to other people or to your secure operations team, because then they see, hmm, there's a suspicious file. Maybe we should do something about it. If you don't use the other rules, you might miss out on certain, on certain files from certain common control frameworks. However, most of the common control frameworks don't have Yara rules defined for them. So you would potentially create them themselves, or maybe someone else can do that. I created these rules to take an example on how you can use the powerful function of Yara to monitor directories and files. The next file I want to talk about, the next function in OBS I want to talk about is file integrity monitoring. How could file integrity monitoring potentially be used to monitor um, to monitor for suspicious files? File integrity monitoring monitors directories for file changes. Um, you can do it on one level or even recursive. It can be used to monitor sensitive directories. Uh, for example, on Mac, on Mac OS, you have the launch agents directory, launch demons directory, or on Linux, for example, um, for slash A to C or um, use the lib directory, for example. But this file integrity monitoring also monitors on the move to file action or moved from, not just update, create, or modify, because the implementation of file integrity monitoring with Yara rules is different than actual F uh, file integrity monitoring for the screen in general. Now, this is a simple example to show you how we could configure with OS query um, which directories it should look at. As you can see here, I'm telling my, my OS query on a MacBook to, uh, to check different directories, the temp folder, the workspace folder, which contains most of my source code and stuff, and make sure nothing weird happens that I don't know about, uh, or the launch agents, for example. 
As you can see, the last part states users and then a percent a percentage sign. Basically means I wanna in the users folder for every other user, I wanna monitor the large agents directory. Now, what does it actually look like if a file enters one of those directories? As you, can, as you saw the last part in my configuration, I was monitoring for every user the last agent directory, every single user. So what I did was I used the MIDI framework to um, generate an app for payload. And then I executed that on the MacBook. And then from my command control server, I said, great, um, enable persistence on my victim, on my MacBook. And for persistence, it creates uh, large agent that for this time I called I, I called com.defcon.surfer.agent.peris, which was placed in the large agent folder for my own personal user. And because I was monitoring that, I was really saw this. But even with this, this event can be reported to, um, excuse me, something like Splunk or Elasticsearch, and then maybe a security operations team can look at it and say, hey, hey there's a suspicious file that appeared here that I don't know about. We should investigate this. Now, the next example is process events. Um, OBS query also can, contains, has the capability to monitor process events. It can monitor process execution. It can monitor execution from parent process or from a child process, and then still see what the parent process is, um, which can be quite useful. Or for example, um, it can, for example, monitor for OS execute on MacBook, for example, or partial execution on um, Windows or on Linux, let's say on command line execution of Python or something else. Two examples I, came up, I could come up with was Hidden Lotus and Lame Buyer. Those two more families from Mac. Why is an example? Because in their um, complete process tree, both of them use OS script to execute certain actions. So if you monitor for unauthorized OSA script execution, you might have called these two families if, they were, if you were infected with those two families. Now, what does it look like? Basically, I tell um, OBS query, every 60 seconds, give me all information from process events where the command line contains the word OSA. Because OSA is the first two letters from OSA scripts, which is the command to execute OSA script execution. And when the moments of history really find something, it will look like the result you see on um, the screen. Now, as we've seen before, with file monitoring, I execute a malicious payload and then gain persistence. The, the command line script you see here was the first step. So first I had to download the payload somewhere, which I did with OSD script and then executed it. And as you see, OBS query caught this for me. And all the information can then again be sent to Splunk, Elasticsearch, or anything else that will allow you to intervene if necessary, or at least isolate the device and then investigate how far they got before you got to the device. This can also be used to monitor for, for example, power execution of Python or weird commands, or uh, for example, normal user wouldn't necessarily um, decode B64. Um, strings, stuff like that. It can be used quite, quite a lot of things, but you have to be wary that you don't use too much commands at the same time because you don't want to hog too much uh, resource in the, in the device. Even though OSP is quite powerful, um, you can even combine certain queries so you, have to, you, do, you don't have too many queries running at the same time. Another example I would like to show you that's actually quite powerful, but I talked about before is OS query combined with Sysmon. Now, you're wondering why this is so powerful. So as you all know, Sys Sysmon locks a monitor system activity. It can, it stays active across reboots because it um, also is device and event driver. Now, what kind of functionality can, or what kind of events can, can Sysmon monitor for? Process injection, create pipe, and quite a lot of other things. Now, I talked to a friend earlier, and I, I, I talked him. I told him, "Yeah, combination of this screen and Sysmon, I can catch process in, uh, process injection." However, 
it doesn't con contain user APC calls. Sometimes post injection, you use uh, create remote threads as functionality for that. The user APC calls basically abuses already existing threads, which doesn't create new ones, which, uh, and system cannot see that yet. Now, how would you tie in Sysmon with WestQuery? Sysmon saves all its events in uh, the Windows event block under the channel Microsoft Security Sysmon forward slash operational. Now, WestQuery can tap into the Windows events channel and can tap, in this, can tap in that specific channel. So every time there's a new event in there, it will also appear in WestQuery. And WestQuery can parse that uh, the Sysmon event data, and then can um, create an event out of it and send it to Splunk again to ask search or something else. Now, how to set up Sysmon to work with Whisperry? Now, there used to be a very good um, standard config Sysmon made by Swift on security. Now, but nowadays, someone forked it and approved some pull requests and made it even better. Um, the GitHub repository you can see on the screen. Now, to enable Obiscuri to be able to monitor the channel for Windows events that contain all Sysmon events, you just add the flag to the command line or to a flag file, you restart Obiscuri, and it can do that. And then, as we've seen before with all those examples, you can, let's say, run a query every 60 seconds that looks at, that looks at Windows events table, and let's say, I want all events that don't have event ID 10. For example, event ID 17 is create pipe, event ID um, 18 is connect pipe, event ID 23 is DNS events, if I'm not mistaken. This is an example of create pipe. So as you, most of us know, Cobalt Strike. Cobalt Strike is used by all by redeeming or for adversarial emulation, but now it is also used by the bad guys because it's quite easy to use and quite powerful as well. Cobalt Strike uses pipes named unnamed for communication between the main beacon and sacrificial processes. As an example, there is a pipe with default value msse-number-server that's used to launch shellcode. Now, you would say that's the default value. Yeah, not, not everyone changes the default values of the names of the pipes. So these rules of system um, or this event or this event system will most of the time still contain the default names. Sometimes people might change the, the names, but then you have to find a more creative way to still catch those pipes. Now, so I basically infected myself with a Cobalt Strike Beacon. And then from my command and control laptop of my, of my team server, I said to, um, I said, make, uh, I create a beacon, I execute it on my Windows device, connect back to my control, and as you see, it uh, spawned for me a name pipe called msz 7000 the server, as you can see in the screenshots. This gets called by Sysman, which you see as well. And again, we can send this to Splunk, Elasticsearch, anything you can imagine. Another example that I want to show you that can, can get called by Sysman is process injection. For this, I infected another device with the Apollo Mythic Agents. It uses process injection the process injection to execute certain tasks. Um, for example, in here I said, take a screenshot from me and inject yourself in the process toolbox.exe, which is a which is a tool from JetBrains to maintain mobile IDEs. As a result, as you can see on the screen, again Obiscuri picked it up and told me technique T1055 and the name is process injection. And it tells me what tool it, what tool was used to to uh, to use the process injection in so okay, correction it shows me it tells me also if what pro process it's trying to inject code and so on so even these events we can easily now from whisker recent straight to splunk elastic search or something else and then alert on this again now i really want to like to talk about reverse cells as well now Reverse cells, they are quite uh, common because sometimes you have bad teams or um, the bad guys who would like connection from connection from a device back to an own server. What are the reverse, the, the, these reverse cells used for? Um, session established from the victim to the attacker. 
Um, some of this solution when the victim's device is not directly reachable, maybe it's behind nuts or something else. But if you initially infect the, the victim, but you can't directly connect to it, you need a reverse shell. So you can open reverse shell and send it straight back. Now, most of these reverse shells are without DTY. DTY basically allow you to enhance the functionality of the shell you have. Um, reverse shells can be launched in multiple different ways. Uh, for example, Netcat, Python, Perl, Bash. Most languages can, can spawn reverse shell in their own way. I show a few examples and after explanation how we can catch them as well. So these are three examples. Um, Python and Perl look almost the same, just a different language. Almost the, but rest, almost the same. The bash is quite more simple. Um, all of those three, there's only one that will um, give you a shell with TTY, which is the bash version. Because you can only, if you're not mistaken, you can only get TTY if the parent process has um, TTY as well. So if you want to spawn a reverse shell, only if the parent process has already TTY, you can use, you can give, give enhanced functionality in your shell. Now, let's see, let's quickly analyze how, for example, Python would, would, would launch in reverse shell. Now, it's, it has no access to TTY because the parent process, Python itself, doesn't have any connection to TTY. Um, it spawns reverse shell port 1111 to IP address 10.0.0.123. And we want all input, output, and errors sent straight to the socket file descriptor to our reverse, to our reverse shell back at the one on servers, not to the victim. So otherwise, the victim might see that something is going on. So it redirects all the, the, the STD out, STD and STDR to the file descriptor and close the original ones and then spawns the shell with bin bash. Now, of course, with the whisk query, you want to be able to catch those things. So this is quite a large query combined, that, that combines one to three tables, processes, process open circuits, and process open files. With this entire query, we can see if there's potentially a shell running that's where post of files process ID is zero, and that has in the name um, either sh or bash. Now, because the shell I showed with Python will spawn a reverse shell that will be called by this, I'll show the result, of course. This is the result. We see that it spawns a reverse shell to IP address 51, 210, and so on, on port 1111. And we can see that the command line is bin sh-i. And we can see in the parent command line is the entire reverse shell with Python that we executed. Now, I would like to mention as well, this was a test on Mac OS. Reverse shells are quite uh, they depend on the operating system, how they operate, on how on what they're connected to, and how they look like. So you might have to fine tune these queries for other, for other operating systems. In Linux, it might be a little different on Windows again. This is just an example of how, how you can catch a reverse shell on MacBook or Mac OS. Now, let's go to the final piece of my talk, alerting. Now, we've seen how command and, control, command and control frameworks are made, uh, are used, how they work. We've seen how OS query works. We've seen multiple ways how we can catch certain elements from frameworks or certain IOCs with OS query. Yara rules, file integrity monitoring, Sysmon, you can catch reverse shells if you find the wrong queries, and so on and so on. But we also want to open, uh, monitor everything and make sure that we can alert them. So, Alerting should be the next step. So you have an event now that's been detected. What's next? So detection is only a small part. You want to empower your security teams. You want to make sure that they know what's happening so they can intervene as soon as possible. I have two small examples with Splunk and Elasticsearch to show you. So this is a small pipeline, a little pipeline with Splunk, four elements. So we have on endpoints, always query running, and the other icon you see is the icon of the Splunk folder. Uh, universe folder, which is the 
most lightweight forwarder they have. For which query, basically, um, since all the scheduled queries it does constantly per log file, the universal forwarder monitors that file. Even though item it sees, if it has a, if it has a rule set itself, it's still, it will send it to the Splunk instance. Now, the Splunk instance will gather all the data, and in Splunk instance, we can create some alerts. Let's say I want an alert on um, process injection or create pipe. Then Splunk can send an alert to Slack or PageDuty. What does it look like, you say? This is a small example of how this might look like. For example, on the you have the OS query output of an event that Sysman potentially saw uh, possible cobalt strike post, post exploitation jobs. How did it start? Because it saw a pipe name that looked like a cobalt strike pipe name. Um, post X underscore and then four random characters. This is the default pipe name that Cobalt Strike uses for post, post exploitation jobs. So obviously, with Universal Forward, sends this data to Splunk, and next you can see that there is an alert created, generated on Splunk that will um, alert in real time if it gets, a, gets an event that um, has certain, certain conditions. And to the right, on to the, the last part, you can see what alert looked like in Slack. So this is from OS query to alert in Splunk that will trigger on, that will send a message to Slack. And on Slack, the, the Slack message you can see potential cobalt strike named by detected, where it was detected, which technique, what's technique name, the pipe name, the image, potential file version if there is any file version, and the link to the specific event of the alert. Now, the next pipeline I would like to show you is um, with, AL, with AL, um, ALK stack. Basically, we, can, we could say Elastic and Kibana because I don't use Dostash in this sense. Here we use OSQuery combination with file beats. And again, OSQuery has scheduled queries that puts data in a log file. File beat will monitor a log file and sends the data it needs to Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch contains all the data and the Kibana has a learning functionality that can, for example, send the data to Slack, to PageDuty, anything else you can imagine. Now, what does this look like? So we, again, we have an event and this time I took an event that um, was triggered on a Yara rule. So again, the Empire of Defcon shellcode stager triggers a Yara rule and we see Ah, it was uh, triggered in a home directory, and which are will match was empire wind shell code. And you have two strings. Now, it seems that they did like a search, and in mid you can see that I created a rule that would trigger on <coughs> on these events. Now that rule, when it sees an event, at least one event or more. It will, send an, it will send an alert to PagerDuty that you can see that then maybe sends a message to my Slack or to my cell phone or anything else to tell me a YAR rule is triggered, maybe this should be investigated. Of course, it can be used, for example, with security operations teams who are on call. For example, they get a message on their phone, they get a phone call that when the system tells them something happened, this alert, please investigate. And you can acknowledge, resolve, and anything else. Now, we've seen already now, we've seen that we have an event on query can be sent to Splunk, for example, and to Slack or to PageDuty to do alerting on certain events that were found by Sysmon, uh, by query. apologies. But there is a next step as well. Uh, what is next? Maybe SOAR. SOAR stands for Security Orchestration Automation and Response. Now, there are different solutions. For example, you have Phantom. By Splunk, you have Cortex XOR by Palo Alto, you have Alien Vault USM, and so on. Now, what is the advantage of SOAR actually? Basically, they allow you to automate tedious tasks or tasks that normally your security operations team does. As an example, for example, Phantom with the playbooks. Let's say I have an event that um, obviously sees um, a file. On a system that triggers the error rule. 
it sends alerts, it sends data to Splunk. Splunk sees this, sends alert to Slack. At the same time, also there is a playbook in Phantom. Now Phantom can say, ah, oh, interesting. It sees what host is on. It, Phantom can potentially connect to that host, get out of file, and um, detonate it on various tools to see what the file actually does effectively is. And if it says, oh, this is a bad file, it can maybe react and, and automatically contain the device the file was found on or alert security team, this is really dangerous. The security team didn't have the chance to react yet. Smart platforms can be used to improve the quality of life for secure, for secure operation teams to prevent um, alert fatigue. Because some of the secure operation teams get so many alerts that they are um, that they can tie to alerts and there is a huge backlog. So SOAP platforms can help there to make the backlog smaller and already the certain tasks that secure operations teams don't have um, don't have the energy for or the capacity for. So I think SOAP platforms are really good use and could potentially help those teams a lot. Now, this was my, um, so what have, so what do I have seen in the, my talk today? So first I've been doing what is OBS query and what is, what is it made for? How does it work? What does it do? Afterwards, we've seen how common control frame works. Um, some of them can be set up, which ones exist and how the payloads might work. We've also seen how we can catch IOCs created by those frameworks. Then we've quickly seen how your shells can be spawned and how we can catch those refresh cells as well. We, I've also went over um, how you can set up certain alerting pipelines, how they should work on um, to alert on certain events that Whiskery or Sitman has seen. In the end, I quickly went over how SOAP platform can improve the quality of life for security operations teams. These are some of the resources I used. I um, put them here on the slide because I also believe in uh, attribution or credit where credit is due. I would like to thank you all for listening to my talk. I hope you learned something. And if you would like to um, chat with me, you can find me on the internet somewhere um, or find me in the speaker channel on Discord as well. Thank you all and see you next time. These are also my contact details if you would like to talk to me.